Hello, this is Jim from the Monopoly Project. We're on uh, the Vista Lakes. We're on the uh, Monopoly Project yacht. Every successful real estate investor has a yacht, and this is ours. Uh, unfortunately, it's the Bikini Girls' day off, and so uh, it's just me. Uh, but we're uh, over at the clubhouse. We're floating by. Uh, you're going to see some geese here in the background a while. But we're here to review um, this book by Ronald Rollheiser, The Holy Longing. And so uh, I put some extensive notes in the text that you can see, and I'm going to be reading from those notes and hopefully adding a little more. Um, but anyway, like I said, the, the complete title of the book is The uh, Holy Longing, The Search for a Christian Spirituality by Ron Rollhauser. And I got this book from my oldest sister recommended it, and it is outstanding. I will point out that it is a difficult reading. It's not, uh, you got to think of what you're talking about. It's deep. And he doesn't really quote directly from Scripture, uh, even though he footnotes it in the back, because he assumes that he, you know what he's referring to. So, but here's a, here's a quick outline of the review. Like I said, you can see this on the website, um, because I had to get my thoughts in order, because unlike most of the books I review, this one's fairly deep. Uh, it's not really an entertainment. Um, but anyway, the first sentence in the preface, very first sentence in the, in the preface says, this book is for you if you're struggling spiritually. And I thought that may be true, but it's more than that. It's, it's also intensely practical. It's not about theology, but it's about what theology should drive you to do. So it's, it's about actions and what actions should be, you be taking as a Christian. Um, and, and he puts it on page 102, among a lot of other places. He said it's aren't, that, that Christian spirituality is, is incarnational, you know, from the carnate uh, being of, you know, in, in Latin meat, you know, human body and not theistic. So it's because we do have bodies. We are bodies. And it's a constant theme through the book. And I think it's good. I strongly recommend this book because it's a practical guide to what a Christian should do or be doing. It's not about theology. It's about actions. And so just a short bio of uh, Ronald Roheiser, which I guess he's a OMI, which is Missionary Oblates of the Mary Inoculate. It's a Catholic organization that uh, that tends to the poor mostly. That's their uh, that's their uh, objective. Uh, but he wrote the, the page. The book's about 250 pages, including uh, in, including the um, including the footnotes and everything. And then there's some references in the back and such. But he he first wrote it in 1998, and he updated it in 2013. Um, uh, and although he is a Roman Catholic and a Roman Catholic priest. He draws from all Christian faiths in this book, um, and he doesn't elevate Roman Catholic teachings or thoughts above the others. He honestly, out, for example, he honestly outlines the differences between Roman Catholic, Protestant, and secular beliefs on page 46 through 48. And on page 93, he explicitly disagrees with Roman Catholic teaching that you need a priest to, for confession to, uh, to forgive sins. You know, that's one of the major theological difference between Roman Catholic and most Protestants uh, denominations that uh, we Protestants believe that uh, that we can go directly to Jesus that's the whole point of Jesus coming we can go directly to Jesus and he uh, intercesses for us with God and he sits, stands at the right hand of God and speaks for us so anyway so even though uh, Father Rollheiser is a Catholic priest it, 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 it is not a Catholic book which is good. Um, the, he starts with four non-negotiable non -negotiable pillars of spirituality. And he's starting on page 53, he lists these. And numbers 1, 3, and 4 are not really surprising. They won't surprise you. They are private prayer and private morality, mellowness of heart and spirit, community as a as a constituent element of true worship. I, so basically you have to be in private prayer and you have to be pr uh, privately or you have to be in good standing with God. Uh, not that we don't sin, but just that, that we understand these things and accept them. Um, we should have a mellowness of heart and spirit and not bring judgment on others. And finally, the third one, of course, is we have to be part of a community. You can't be a Christian by yourself. So those three are not surprising. I think everybody agrees with it. 
the number two could be controversial depending on where you come from in your in your Christian faith and even among the various denominations. The number two he lists is social justice. Um, in the next few pages, he discusses why four, all four are absolutely necessary, and that e ignoring even one severely distorts your um, spirituality. I want to have more to say about social justice, and I'll do that separately. He actually has an entire chapter dedicated to that, and, and I have some thoughts and comments and issues on that. So um, I, I will discuss that in, in a little more depth in, uh, in Chapter 7 when we get to that. I do want to say this book had an immediate impact on my life. Um, it had an immediate impact on my understanding of what I do and, and some of what I don't do in terms of actions um, that constitute elements of true worship and spirituality. Um, examples are on page 80, 84 and 89 where Rollheiser says, our prayer needs flesh to back it up and your touch is Christ's touch. And again, this is his arc, incarnate argument that we are human beings with bodies and unless we are laying hands on each other and praying with each other, uh, it, it, it uh, is not effective. It, it, it's absolute necessity to be incarnate. And, uh, and then of course on page 91 he discusses the importance of visiting the sick or dying or elderly. And uh, again, that's one of the things I do. I, I do it because uh, it's the right thing to do, but now I understand, you know, as he points out, that it's just a, a basic element of Christian spirituality to be a Christian. Um, one, of the things, one of the aspects of the book I really like is I, I like it when I read a book and the author says things that are obviously true but usually not acknowledged. Um, and I, I got a whole list of them here. Uh, page 25 he says, generally speaking today in the Western world most of, adults, most of us adults live in a certain chronic depression. I think that's true. Um, he goes on on page 27 to say, In Western culture, the joyous shouting of children often irritates us because it interferes with our depression. That is why we have invented a term, hyperactivity, so that we can, in good conscience, sedate the spontaneous joy of many of our children. I, you know, that is absolutely true. Um, we see that everywhere, and I've experienced it myself when the grandkids are having fun, too much fun, and I'm crabby. Uh, but again, that spontaneous joy is is an element of childhood, and it should be an element of Christian spirituality. Um, page 63, going on with things that he says that are absolutely true, we end up turning Christianity into a philosophy, an ideology, and a moral code, but ultimately missing what Christianity is all about, a relationship with the real person. And I think in that, again, he mean, by relationship with the real person, he means obviously Jesus, because Jesus is a real person. But he also means other human beings, as we spoke earlier of, you know, incarnate. You know, these are real human beings that we're doing. We're going under the bridge now. Um, and then on page 64, he expounds on social justice and it being essential and non-negotiable. But again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, page 74, what Jesus wants from us is not admiration, but imitation. We should be imitating Christ's uh, example, and I'll, I'll go into some of this later. When Christ was here on earth, his, his ministry was healing the sick, casting out demons, and forgiving sins. And uh, we are called to do that now in his absence until his second coming. Um, and again, hitting the same thing on page, the, same theme on page 99. Hence, a Christian spirituality is always as much about dealing with each other as it is with dealing with God. And again, he's right. You know, we shouldn't get all wrapped up in theology. We need to, uh, to deal with what's in the here and now and let the kingdom of heaven come. And then finally, another one, not finally, another one. Page 103, he says, all babies look very much alike. And, and I, I have to agree with that. In fact, my friend Dave and I, I have a joke that all babies look like the Pope. Um, he had some grandsons and we had some grandsons and when they're young all babies look like an old man with a bald head and you know really smooth skin and so I told that to my daughter Jennifer who's the mother of three young children and of course she disagreed with that and so I so I had to share the preface with her he actually prefaces that phrase with despite mother's protest to the contrary 
but uh, all babies do look alike. So, um, page 165, one of the great anthropological imperatives innate in human nature is that we eventually must make peace with the family. And that's unfortunate. Um, I've been blessed with a very wonderful family, you know, my sisters and their husbands and their children and grandchildren. I, I basically haven't had any problems or issues at all, but I know a lot of families struggle and it's very hard to see your family, your children, your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your grandparents, uh, any relatives struggling either under material want or spiritual want. And it's very hard to help people in your own family. It's just, it seems like a lot of times because of that, we hand them over to the experts, either medical experts, doctors or psychiatrists, nurses, um, you know, whatever, you know, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, you know, whatever it is, it, it is very difficult to deal with it, your family, but eventually you have to make peace with them. And then on page 193, he says, Sexuality is such a powerful fire that it is not always easy to channel it in life-giving ways. It's very power, and it is the most powerful force on the planet. I've long believed this, and, and uh, I was really encouraged to see that he states this. Um, he, he goes on to say, it, it uh, sexuality is the fire which ultimately lies at the base of everything, including spiritual life. Um, I'm going to talk more about that. He has a separate cha chapter on sexuality in chapter 9, or I think it's 9. It's the one after the, uh, um, the uh, social justice one. But anyway, so f for sexuality, I'm going to come back to that because it, it, it's a very important, and it, it's one of the best descriptions and explanations of the role of sexuality in a Christian's life that I have ever seen, I've ever read. Um, so we'll, we'll get back to that. And then the last one I wanted to highlight that I really like where he makes these statements that just jump out at you is page 232 he says, Hence for us all ritual is suspect and smack of superstition or magic. And he's talking about the general loss of respect and use of ritual uh, and not rote ritual. Um, it, he is true we, we in the modern world do not um, do not really uh, do ritual anymore. We, we think it is rich, a ritual, literally. And so, and I think that's a big loss. Actually, I think that's one of the reasons why the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, attracts so many um, converts from other Christian faiths, is that they have, they have a very elaborate ritual set up that is very satisfying, if done correctly. And so, um, so I think that's a very important insight, is that we need to reincorporate ritual within our uh, Christian walk. Um, and then uh, next I wanted to go on to some interesting points that he made theologically and otherwise. On page 83 he says, namely that God's power is now partially dependent on human action. And this isn't literally true because God is sovereign. But given the context of the argument he makes, I agree with him. Uh, as I said earlier, we the church are called to complete the Great Commission by completing what Jesus started in his ministry, and that is healing the sick, casting out demons, and forgiving sins all in the name of Jesus Christ. That is what he has commanded us. That is how we go forth and make disciples of all nations. Um, so that's an, I think it's an important point. And then on page 97, he goes into a very interesting discussion of John 6, 51 through 55, where, Je where Jesus says to the bunch of Jews who are assembled around him, um, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no salvation, or words to that effect. I'll read them, in a, why don't I read them right now? John 6, 51 through 55, I think this is the ESV version. Um, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, I will raise them up on the last day. 
for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Um, Rollheiser analyzes this, and I've read this before and been puzzled by it. Um, there's a lot of analysis on it if you go on the internet. A lot of people, you know, the, you know, trying to explain it one way or another. The Roman Catholic teaching is that he was speaking literally, and it is of communion, the Eucharist. Um, that has been rejected by a number of Protestant uh, analysts because he uses words here that he doesn't use in the uh, in the institution of, of communion and so it goes on and on the, the discussion but what I really found interesting is 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 Rollheiser's argument is that Christ is you know there's a big question in in scriptural analysis of when is somebody when is Jesus or when is the scripture speaking us to literally and when are they speaking to us in metaphor or parable and a lot of people claim that this is a metaphor um, and so forth. Uh, Rollheiser argues against that by pointing out that the word Jesus uses in the second time he says this is sarx, S-A-R-X, which is a Greek for flesh. The other Greek word for, for body is soma, which is normally used when he, when he does the words of institution for communion. He said, this is my body, take and eat. Um, this is my soma. Here he says, he says Sark, so he's telling them, according to Rollheiser, and I tend to agree with Rollheiser, he's telling them that I am literally, I'm speaking literally. I am not speaking in metaphor. Um, anyway, if you get into that, uh, it's, it's a mystery that the simple words of John, you know, and, and the scriptures aren't really clearly understood. I think some of that is because, I'm not thinking, all of that is because of our sinful nature and, and we broke the perfect creation. Um, as it says in Isaiah, my thought, speaking of God, my thoughts are my, not your thoughts, my ways are above your ways. So once we get to heaven and, you know, and the resurrected body, perfect body, I think we will understand these words perfectly and say, oh, that's what it means. Um, but anyway, I, I list in the, uh, in the text there, there's a whole bunch of links to various discussions of people arguing this on one side or the other. Like I said, I tend to agree with Rollheiser as I agree with the both Lutheran and Roman Catholic view that communion is the real body and blood of Jesus. It is not symbolic. Um, so anyway, going on to some other interesting things, he says, uh, page 124, Thus, the best example of what church baptism and consecration really mean is the example of having and raising children. And uh, he does a very good job in this section of, of explaining that having a family, raising children, and then grandchildren is, is, is really, you understand what it means to give up your life for another. You know, when Jesus said, no greater love hath a man, then he gave up his life for his fellow man. He was, of course, speaking of himself, literally. He was about to go to the cross and die to save us from our sins. Um, and he was also indirectly talking about others in this society who give up their lives, you know, for, for, the, for, for others, you know. Um, specifically the apostles, all but one of them, John himself, were martyred. And so um, I'm getting a call there and so I'm... I'm trying not to answer it, a phone call. Um, so anyway, uh, again, getting back to the no greater love out of the man than he give up his life for his fellow man. Um, he's talking about himself literally. He's talking about, to, he's talking to the apostles in front of him. He's talking to us down through the ages about policemen, soldiers, all of those who goes in harm's way, firemen to, you know, protect and save us. And some of them give the, pay the ultimate price. But he's also talking about this, this uh, concept that uh, Rollheiser is discussing here about not literally giving up your life in the, term, in the sense of being dead, but giving up your dreams, your aspirations, your days. And I see that in my daughter Jennifer. I mean, she basically spends a whole day doing what the kids want in, in a good way. I mean, not, she's not, they're not running her life, but she's uh, sacrificing your life. You're giving up your life for another. And it's, it's the most important function that you can do on this earth, both within the family and outside of the family. So, and then on page 149, he, he says, but you're a lot, you are alive as a 70-year-old, not as a 
not as a 20 year old and he's talking about how we go through different stages in life and you have to come to terms with that and being near 70 I read that and I instantly understood what he meant. Um, I remember being 20 or 25, you know, quote, young. Um, and it is different. Um, and it's different in a good way. And so it's one of the other themes he hits pretty hard is we go through phases in life and we need to, uh, we need to address them. Um, okay, now we're finally at chapter 7. I'm sorry, 7 on my outline, which is chapter 8, in the so which is social justice. Um, I gotta admit, I'm very wary of calls for social justice in general, and especially from Roman Catholics. I was raised as a Catholic. I now attend a Lutheran church, but I don't particularly consider myself Lutheran. Lutheran, you know, in, 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 in that they're any different. The, the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of Jesus. Um, I have my differences with the Catholics and some of the other Protestant denominations, but none of them, none of them break the basic fact that we're here to serve Jesus and we're here to serve others through that and so but I do I am wary of that and I consider the the preferential option for the poor to be a distortion and misuse of scripture if you're not familiar with the preferential option for the poor uh, is described this way the option for the poor preferential option for the poor is one of the newer principles of Catholic social teaching as articulated in the latter half of the 20th century it is also it also is a theological emphasis in Methodism. The concept was championed by many Christian Democratic parties in Latin America at the time. Um, I don't want this book review to degenerate into a political argument or, or even a theological argument. That's not the point. Uh, but I feel I do feel compelled to state my objections, and I and I want to note a, an interesting related point about Rollheiser's treatment of social justice. Throughout the book, um, Rollheiser states a general or a specific principle, and then he gives some examples. And I think that's a very effective technique. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, when they teach you long division, and then you do a few pro you do a few sample program problems, and it comes, you know, the, the it goes both ways, you know, the practical and the theoretical. And so he does you he does state an example of social justice, um, but I. I before I discuss that, I want to put it in some context. Like I said, I want to not so much debate it, but say, first of all, you know, I disagree with the theology of social justice. Again, from that same article on um, op what option for the poor is, it says, judgment, God will ask each person what he did to help, to help the poor and needy. I'm in this, amen, I say to you, whatever you did for the least uh, brothers of mine, you did for me. This is reflected in Catholic canon law, which states the Christian faithful are also obliged to promote social justice and mindful of the precept of the Lord to assist the poor from their own resources. According to said doctrine, the one's words, prayers, and deeds must show solidarity and compassion for the poor. Therefore, when instituting public policy, one must always keep the preferential option for the poor at the forefront of one's mind. Accordingly, this doctrine implies that the moral test of any society is how it treats its most vulnerable members. The poor have the most urgent moral claim on the conscience of the nation. We are called to look at public policy decisions in terms of how they affect the poor. Um, I agree with the scriptures. You know, th this description here says it's Catholic doctrine. I, I agree that it's Catholic doctrine, obviously, but I also agree that the scriptures imply that the moral test of any society is how it treats its most vulnerable members. That is it's constant in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, but, but before I expand on that disagreement, I want to make a note about definitions. And, and, does, and the question is, does the word poor in the statement and in Scripture in general refer to the poor and earthly financial as, assets or, or poor in spirit? Um, I think that's the basis of a lot of disagreement on this subject among many, not just myself. Um, so first, the, the, the poor, whether you define it materially or spiritually, I do not think have any more or less claim on God's, God's grace and His gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Yes, the rich have a harder time of seeing this and accepting the grace and salvation because they have not made in this world and they think they don't need it. But again, that doesn't mean that the rich don't have equal claim to it. 
and you know so i mean to go on you know to, you know all human institutions are corrupt because of sin we're never going to make heaven on earth and as jesus says in matthew 26 11 the poor you will always have with you we're not going to er eradicate poverty through social justice programs um, now, if they were going to rebrand it as the preferential option for the spiritually poor, then I'd agree 100%. That is what we are sent for. We are sent to help the spiritually poor. Uh, very often, they are also materially poor. Um, but just as many rich people and well-off people are spiritually bankrupt, as Pastor Jeff said to me today, and uh, they are poor. They're poor in spirit and that and that is more important than material goods because this world would only last a short time for for us certainly you know 60 80 100 years um but uh we, we if it's spiritually poor then yes we should base all of our policies and such on on that and and jesus sort of reiterates that or makes that point when in mark 2 17 and in two of the other gospels repeat this story he's on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So basically, he, again, he's defining poor in the sense of spirit, you know, the sinners. Um, so, now I want to go on to Rollheiser's one example of a social justice cause. And he uses the example of abortion. Uh oh, I just heard some noise. I don't know if it's me or somebody else. Okay, let's get back. He's, he uses the example of abortion, um, and I'm not doubt, debating or even doubting that abortion should be at the top of the social justice list. I certainly think it is. The unborn child is certainly the least of us in our present environment. They have no legal or moral rights at all. Nobody speaks for them. Um, but in my mind, abortion is a poor example of the social justice causes since it's, it, it's the only one supported by one side of the political spectrum and rejected by the other. Those people most advocating social justice exclude abortion. Um, in fact, they're in favor of it. It is, not, it is now the highest sacrament of the secular humanist list, um, left. Literally. It is literally child sacrifice, you know, like was practiced in the Old Testament by the god Baal and Moloch, where they would sacrifice their children in the fire and throwing them into, into the fire. Um, so, you know, and I, there is a vanishing element in Roman Catholics who continue, rightfully continue to oppose abortion, but there are few and far between, and there's literally nobody left on the left who claims the Roman Catholic faith who opposes abortion. They all support it, or they all say, I'm personally against it, but it's public policy. It's not. And so again, I, I think he should have chosen a better example um, or another example to highlight so that we could discuss and debate social justice and what does it mean within Christian and public policy because um, basically I think it comes down to arguments not about what we're trying to do and that is to protect and provide for the least of us. It comes down to a um, we disagree on the best economic, sociologic, sociological and politic way to achieve those ends. And as an example, I'll state that free market capitalism in, in the West and increasingly now in the East, China and India, has raised more people out of poverty, served them than all the government social policies in history. So we're disagreeing on not what we want to get done, but what's the best way to do it. And so I'm going to leave that for now, but I do put a link in there, uh, a very good list of all the all scripture that, that talks about the poor. So I'll, I'll leave that to you if you're interested in that subject in more detail. And now we get to chapter 9, sexuality. Um, like I said, this is the best discussion of sexuality in a Christian context that I've ever, that I've ever read. Why? Because it's positive, unlike most treatments that are judgmental, defensive, and lecturing. It defines sexuality not just as a good gift from God, but as the essence of God, and it is. We're created in his image. And, you know, on page 92, he says, For this reason, sexuality lies at the center of spiritual life. And this is absolutely true. Page 193 goes on, Sexuality is such a powerful fire that it is not always easy to channel it in life-giving ways. 
its very power, not just for the form of love, life, and blessing, but also for the worst hate, death, and destruction imaginable. Fire which ultimately lies at the base of everything, including spiritual life. Um, in page 194 he says, in fact, it is the greatest energy of all inside us. And that's absolutely true. Um, so I, I, I really like his treatment of sexuality and how it's central to spirituality and it's, a, it's the greatest, I mean other than salvation, it's the greatest gift that God has given us. And again, it's one of those mysteries that we were created in His image and when we finally get to heaven we will understand what we don't understand now. Um, and going on in, in this uh, discussion of some interesting points away from, uh, from sexuality is, well, he's in, the, in the chapter on sexuality, he says, page 195, for this reason, among others, celibacy has been made too much of a spiritual ideal. This is wrong. Those are his words, not mine. My words are, this is absolutely true. The elevation of celibacy um, as, as, as the extreme uh, best way of being spiritual, and, and Paul contributed this in, in his, in his uh, letters. Um, and, of course, the Catholic cheat church requires priests to be celibate. So I think this is a mistake. Um, I think this is something that Luther gets right. It's uh, not natural. Um, not to be said that you can't take a vow of, of spirituality, but it shouldn't be expected as in a Catholic priest, nor should it be um, highlighted and, and uh, glorified as the highest spirituality. Um, on page 206 he says, and this is, he says, In heaven everyone will make love to everyone else, and already now we hunger for that within every cell of our being. I'm not sure what to make of this. I can't think of any scripture to support that. Uh, like I said, there's a mystery of a lot of things we don't understand, and perhaps that is true, but it's certainly not true in a way that we can understand it now. So uh, I don't quite agree I don't quite agree with everything he says. I'll get to a few more. And then on page 210, again, he's talking about this, to sleep alone is to be poor. Going on in the subject of celibacy, he's trying to explain why Jesus was celibate. And, and his argument was that Jesus was celibate to show solidarity with the poor. And I find this to be a stretch. Uh, I think it has to do with the preferential option for the poor and trying to fit the scriptures to what you think is important. Um, but I, I certainly find no support for that argument in any of the scriptures. Um, and so I'm finally near the end. Uh, the other, I had a couple other questions. I, very early in the book, like the first 20 or 30 pages, I came across two things which I, um, I, I disagree, not disagreed with. I, I, could, I, I didn't believe, let me put it that way. And um, let me tell you the first one. On page 16, he says, given our understanding of physics, we know that even the tiniest particles of the universe with their positive and negative charges have something akin to desire and thus have their own kind of soul. Um, being, having studied physics and gotten a degree in physics in my undergraduate days, I, I cannot think of any basis in physics to support this. Uh, he doesn't footnote it. He doesn't explain it further than just assert it. Um, but our current understanding of particles is purely mathematical. You know, we've discovered equations which explain, and by explain I mean predict our world. We can, we can predict our world um, through these uh, methods that we, equations basically. Um, uh, through these techniques and, you know, we've developed technologies that the ancients would consider magic. But these techniques, by and large, are actually all, all, always explain how. They explain how things work, but not why. Only God can, an, can be the answer to why. Um, many people, you know, many people that worship science, and again, I, a lot of people on the left now claim they, they only go by science, think that we understand, think that because we understand how the sun shines for billions a year, how the circulatory system sustains us, how photosynthesis works, um, how, how to make a nuclear bomb, that we no longer need God, that we've explained the universe. It's not true. It, it doesn't explain why. It just explains how. So, 
And then on page 17, he goes on to say, if you put a two inch band of solid steel around a growing watermelon, it will grow. It will, as it grows, burst the steel. And I said, my first thought was, I don't believe that. And so, of course, I did what we normally do in these days. I Googled it and I could not find any reference, you know, any videos of somebody putting a band of around a growing watermelon doing a time lapse, you know, video of it exploding. I just don't believe that's true. And I don't know where he got it and he doesn't footnote it and so on and so forth. So in any case, uh, that's the end of my review. I do, I do recommend the book wholeheartedly if you're interested in these subjects, you know, whether you're Catholic or not. It's not a Catholic book, it's a Christian book. Um, he makes a lot of good points and most importantly, he talks about what you need to be doing, not what you need to be thinking or what you need to believe or, or arguing theology. You need to be out there in the street doing what Jesus called you to do and that is to heal the sick, cast out demons and forgive sins and, and, and spread the word, you know, make disciples of all nations. Um, so, uh, so again, Roll Heiser's book, I heartily agree with it. And it's just about sunset and I'm getting a lot of phone calls. So wondering where I am or am I lost? And so I'm going to head back home and answer some of these calls. Thank you. This is Jim for the Monopoly Project.